Uh, with me is Thor Steingraber, the Executive and Artistic Director of the Eunice and Soraya Nazarian Center for the Performing Arts in LA. Thor commissioned these music pieces, which will officially premiere in February next year. Also with us is Gabriella Smith, a composer and environmentalist. She wrote the music for the piece you will hear very soon. So Thor, let's start with you. So you read John's story in 2020, and something about it made you want to commission music. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what exactly inspired you. Sure, uh, I think, first of all, John's piece was uh, so special. Uh, first of all, we in Los Angeles and throughout California couldn't breathe for the whole month of August of 2020. And by the time his piece came out in December, the way he looked back just a couple months previous and illuminated that moment uh, in a way that wasn't about fleeing from your house and grabbing the, you know, the birth certificates and the photographs, but was really about the trees and what they meant and their value. And um, I was so moved by that piece. At the same time, we were doing something called Music Caravan. We had underwritten um, Etienne, who's the violinist today in, in those three pieces, uh, who traveled around California in a VW bus that had been restored and played concerts in farms and vineyards and farmers markets during the middle of the pandemic. And so Etienne and I actually were on the phone and, and I said, read this piece by John Branch. You've been spending your nights in the Redwoods and, and tell me what you think of this piece. And from that conversation came, uh, came Trilogy. Uh, but I think the most important thing is uh, in programming music, uh, it's easy to program music that is not relevant, that is not timely, that is not necessarily addressing the issues of a day. But it's also so gratifying to do that because otherwise those of us in the music field feel helpless. And, and in August of 2020, I was feeling helpless. And by the time I read John's article and decided to commission the piece, I felt like I just had something to do. And I think all of us need that something to do. Yeah. Um, for those of us who live in LA, that summer it was like you couldn't see the sky and it was so hot. It was like over, I think we broke all the heat records. It was really an apocalyptic time when that story came out. Um, and for those of you who don't know, that piece, John's piece, is broken up into three different parts, one for each of these most famous California trees that all have national parks named after them. And you actually wanted the music to reflect that same structure. And I wonder why you decided to choose three different composers as opposed to having just one sort of write the whole piece. Yeah, it was really important to us to have three different artistic voices uh, to address each of the trees and really give those tree species their attention. Uh, and also to create a piece that would gain some interest in, and visibility like, like it is today. Uh, and so um, Etienne and I made a list of 10 composers we thought might be interested, and not every composer would be, right? Uh, and funny enough, our top three composers all said yes. And then the very tricky part was who was gonna compose which tree? And we thought we might have to, have to arm wrestle over that, uh, but in fact, each of them chose three different tree species without any prompting whatsoever, so it really started to take on, um, it, it was an ined inevitability about, about that. Um, also, I think you'll hear today that the three pieces have such different voices and characteristics, and um, while, of course, you wanna create a cohesive evening uh, of music, you also want to, um, to really pay attention to, to the differences as well. And so I think, I think these, uh, Gabriella and her two colleagues have done exactly that. Yeah, so one of those three composers that you most wanted was Gabriella. Uh, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you combine environmentalism and composing beyond just this piece. Yeah, well, I love that Kara started out this session by saying um, her first reaction to can art save us was no because that was also my first reaction. And I think 10 years ago, I would have given a very definitive no. But my thinking has evolved over time. Growing up here in the Bay Area, I was always very attracted to the natural world around us and spending time, as much time outdoors as possible. I spent five years volunteering on a songbird research project when I was a teenager in Point Reyes, and that was a very formative experience in my life. And I intended to study ecology or climate science after that, which would have been a natural progression of that and my love of math and science. But at the same time, I also fell in love with music. And it had a way of taking over my life. And I also discovered that I was better at that, frankly, than most other things in my life. So I became a musician. And for years, I really struggled with this idea of 
why am I doing this? Because it feels so insignificant in comparison to the issue of climate change, which was what I intended to devote my life to. But recently, you know, in the past 10 years, in the past five years, I've come to the realization that while, of course, we need climate scientists, we also, we don't only need climate scientists, we need an entire cultural shift. And in order to do that, we need everyone in every field and every aspect of society to be devoting their lives to climate solutions and making them an integral part of our lives. And I think music can be a really powerful driving force for that. I think that's actually one of the things I've enjoyed most about this event is that it really shows us that no matter who we are and what field we're in, there's a place for us in climate solutions and we can all be part of this together. And that's really what I'm trying to do with music now is you know, where that's the place where I have influence is in my field in music. And so how can I be part of that with music and influence the world with music, which is the thing that I happen to be good at. And music is, hmm. music is not only for entertainment, music is a tool, a very powerful tool for change and for societal transformation and for communal action. And um, which I think, especially now, is very important to be using every tool we have at our disposal. And music is one of those. It plays an important role as one of the, not the single most important one, of course, but one of all of these things that we need to be doing. And um, music, as was talked about a lot today already, it helps us feel the things we need to feel in order to do the work that we need to do, whether that's grieving the things we need to grieve or getting so excited about climate solutions that we want to get up and dance and get to work. And I think my work really is more towards the latter and about the joy in this work, um, because I really feel that joy. And I also think that's the way I connect to music most. And I think and hope you'll hear that in the piece after this. I want to say about Kara's comment, uh, you know, can art save us? At first, I thought no. And I walked out of the room at that time to get mic'd. I was not angry. I just got, went and got mic'd. Uh, can art save us? No. And as I was walking to get mic'd, I thought, but can you imagine us being saved without art? I know that's rhetorical, but I think that's absolutely true. First of all, what is going to cause us joy? What's going to cause us to dance? What's going to cause us to have the clearing in the dense wood of our, of our lives? that Tara talked about, if it were not for art? And mostly, what's going to motivate us to be together in community without it, right? So uh, as I went to get my microphone, I thought, really, that question needs to be reversed. Can you imagine us having solutions without art? And to be in a communal space, we say at the Soraya, to share an armrest with a stranger is really such a powerful thing. Uh, strangers who you may not have anything in common with, and in fact, it's even better when you don't. That's the power of a concert and music. So um, I, I think you know, great, great moments of inflection have been brought about by art pieces. Um, in the middle of the AIDS epidemic, you know, Angels in America was a turning point. Will Trilogy be a turning point? Maybe yes, maybe, maybe no, but we have to contribute to that. And so I think, I think there is um, a necessity for art to be at the table. Yeah. Um, you're both drawing this connection between sort of the news that's filled with despair and music, and I wonder if you can sort of walk us through how you actually make that connection. Like, Gabrielle, what, how do you put voice to a tree? Like, what did, how did you write this piece about the Joshua trees? Well, for me, I knew from the beginning that I wanted to approach this as not only being about a tree as an individual species, but the tragedy of climate change is not that we're losing individual species, but we're losing this entire world. And so my piece is more a reaction, not a reaction, but more inspired by not just the Joshua tree itself, but the entire Mojave Desert ecosystem. And so I spent a, some time in the Mojave camping and hiking um, about nine months ago when I was about to start thinking about this piece. And I actually took uh, a little field recorder with me. And um, as I was hiking along, I would uh, touch the spines of the cacti, which makes some beautiful sounds, actually. And I recorded them. And, and I also went on a hike through uh, a burnt Joshua tree forest, which was a very powerful and kind of apocalyptic experience, but also really beautiful in a way. 
and I picked up the burnt top of a Joshua tree that had fallen to the ground and, and played it like a percussion instrument and recorded myself doing that. So um, those recordings will be in the piece, not in the version today. The version today is uh, purely acoustic, but you'll hear sort of um, almost imitations of those sounds, um, which I've created by putting paper clips on the strings of the violin, um, which is something I love to experiment with and plucking the instrument in various unexpected ways. And so I think you'll hear that kind of curiosity about the sonic landscape and exploration leading to joy in, in the work. I wonder, did taking that trip there and looking at all of the destruction, it sounds like it actually made you feel hopeful. Is that true? Am I reading that right? Like that to me is so incredible that you're taking this thing that is inherently bad, that these trees have burned, these forests are suffering, and you, you, know, you just use the word hope. Yeah, I have a complicated relationship with the word hope, as I think people have already discussed today. Is I, I think it can be misinterpreted as too passive, mm -hmm. and so I often avoid that word for that reason. Um, really, I think when I write music that is joyful, what I'm trying to get at is not that I necessarily have hope in this passive sense, but that I really believe that we need to be joyful and get excited in order to do this work. And I want to write music that makes me feel that way. And that's more my approach to joy in the work that I do. Yeah, I think Thor, you and I have talked before about how reading the news and I'm a journalist, writing the news too can be very lonely. And there's something about music, as you were saying, with the shared armrest that is inherently um, joyful, even when the music isn't. And I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, actually, John Branch said it best. When we conceived of the piece, I didn't want to call John immediately because I didn't want him to feel implicated as a journalist in creating a piece about his piece. So we conceived it, and then I called John, and I told him, and he said, you know, you write these things. Now, this is a Pulitzer-nominated New York Times journalist. You write these pieces, and you wonder, is anybody out there? Did anyone read it? Um, you know, because it's a lonely thing. And I said, well, you know, we feel lonely on this side too, John. But here's the thing, when you go to a theater, it's not so lonely. And, and that power, the shared armrest, is the thing that I think is so interesting. Um, and, and to bring life to a piece of journalism, and to, a, to more than that, obviously, but to bring life to it, and then share that, the thing that we do best in the performing arts is convene people, right? And so I think, I think that's, a, that's a tool or a weapon all into itself. Um, I, I also think that the, you know, it was funny right after the last excerpt, um, John and, and Andrew were in the next panel, and Andrew immediately said, oh, it's so great to have music so we can get both sides of the brain engaged in this problem, right? Um, and that was, that was, that's a common and really positive um, perspective to that. Uh, but then Andrew, you know, rolls out his seven-point plan. And we're not on that seven-point plan, let's be clear. I mean, no climate, no head, no leader of tech or business or climate scientist is going to say, and music is part of the solution. We know that. We know that, that we're a different part. We're sort of the backstage, if you will, to that solution. But certainly in all of that is the ability to step out of our isolation and, and be together and, and to be inspired that way. Yeah, I mean, it might be on the backstage, but we wrote, or I wrote about your, about this composition. We asked readers to write in about works of art that had inspired them, and we got hundreds and hundreds of responses. Like, people are so moved by fiction, documentaries, music. It's not, it feels like it's not an obvious piece, but it obviously is. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so before we hear your piece, is there anything we should know about it? Any, anything you want us to know going in? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, um, some of it is inspired by the actual sounds of me hiking through the desert and um, playing these plants like instruments. And so in the beginning of the piece, you can imagine me hiking in the Mojave in the cactus yucca scrub, um, hearing the sonic landscape and experiencing the beautiful visual landscape um, as the piece starts. And then as the piece grows and develops, it transforms into, from this desert landscape, more into an expression of joy at getting to be part of this global effort to save the world and to be part of this larger community um, participating in climate solutions. Well, I'm really excited to hear it. 
Um, before we bring the musicians back up, I want to thank you both uh, and bring on our co-hosts, Cara Buckley and David Gellis, one last time. <laughs>